Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for invitation and especially for arranging special time. Uh, so, uh, well, we will discuss uh, minimal dispersion. It's, uh, in my opinion, quite interesting problem, and uh, especially that it's uh, very easy to to set uh, to describe the problem. And at the beginning, it looks very simple, but surprisingly, it's not very simple. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, problem uh, is the following. So uh, we have uh, we have uh, just unit cube, something like this, and we want to uh, well, we want uh, we fix some epsilon, and then uh, we want to find uh, endpoints inside the cube with minimal n, of course, such that uh, any box with parallel uh, axis parallel to coordinate spaces uh, uh, has one of such points. So question, what is uh, minimal n uh, in such setting? So uh, we will denote such integer but by n epsilon d. Of course, it's function of uh, two variables, epsilon and d. And uh, <clears throat> equivalently, we can uh, fix number n and ask about volume epsilon. So uh, given two integers n and z, what is the largest epsilon such that whenever you put n points uh, in any position, you always will be able to find a box of volume epsilon, also uh, axis parallel. So such number is called dispersion uh, of the cube, because you can ask, of course, uh, such question for uh, many convex or non-convex bodies. So we will speak about cube. It is called dispersion and uh, functions, uh, at least if you fix D functions, N of epsilon D and dispersion, uh, uh, dispersion star of N D, uh, they are uh, inverse to each other. So uh, let me introduce formal setting. Uh, so by Arc graphic D, I will denote all uh, such uh, boxes under consideration. So we have cube zero one, or zero one. We consider all possible boxes, uh, uh, axis parallel boxes. So of course they can be presented as uh, as uh, the product of uh, of segments and uh, dispersion. Uh, uh, of a given set uh, is a, a maximal uh, ball, uh, maximal box uh, with axis parallel, axis parallel box, uh, such that it doesn't contain any point from the set P. And then uh, the function that I just uh, explained before uh, can be uh, formally written as infinum over all sets uh, with, uh, uh, with cardinality N, so you take best configuration to have uh, uh, to, to forbid having large boxes. So first uh, you find the best configuration, infinite over all configurations, and then you find the uh, largest box. This is dispersion. And my function uh, n, which I started with and which I'm going to formulate uh, all results uh, with respect to n, it's uh, inverse function. So uh, uh, formally, it's written like this, but it's uh, easier to understand that uh, that we have uh, we fix epsilon and uh, we find how many uh, points uh, we need to put uh, inside the box. And uh, well, I uh, I will uh, I will uh, speak uh, uh, a bit about history and. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we'll give few results. So first result, probably first, well, it's probably not first, but uh, one of the first results was by Root and uh, Tisha and uh, Larcher provide uh, even better estimate using similar idea very recently. Upper bound uh, for number of points uh, is bounded by essentially e to the d over epsilon. Uh, very recently, actually after my result, after I, after my paper already was accepted, uh, uh, Buch and Tao put uh, preprint, they proved much better estimate. They improved uh, uh, C to the D to D square upper estimate over epsilon. And um, 
for uh, this uh, probably best results for uh, upper bound. I will say about one more result later for uh, large epsilon, but uh, those are very good results. Uh, the best known results for uh, for very small epsilon. And uh, what about lower bound? How tight the, the results? Uh, first is uh, just a very simple observation that if you have a ball, a box, zero, one cube, uh, then you can, of course, uh, just split in n plus one parts like this. And then if you have n point, you always will find uh, one uh, strip, which is, uh, which is without point. So estimate uh, one over n is very simple, which immediately lead uh, to estimate n larger than one over epsilon, essentially. So, uh, so question uh, that in denominator, we should have at least one uh, over epsilon. And uh, first result, which is, which is non-trivial, it's a slight improvement only by constant uh, five over four. But still, it's already not trivial. Was proved by Dimitrescu and uh, Jeanne, and uh, also uh, they proved a bit more. But I, I will mention only this result. And uh, first result, which is uh, non-trivial in a sense uh, that it depends on d. So uh, we see that uh, this quantity, this function, n uh, is increasing with respect to d. Uh, was uh, proved uh, very recently, uh, just uh, well, in 17, uh, by Eisleiner, Hinrich, and Rudolf. They proved essentially they proved logarithm d over four epsilon. Of course, we uh, we we usually consider epsilon to be uh, small, say smaller than one over eight. Then it's essentially logarithm over epsilon, so it grows with respect to d. Uh, let me continue. I will put here on this slide uh, two results that I mentioned. Uh, well, two, two, yeah, two results that I mentioned uh, bound for uh, n. And uh, if uh, we want to send epsilon to zero and we don't care about, uh, uh, about uh, constant uh, depending on dimension, then essentially problem is solved because uh, we have that uh, behavior of n is cd over epsilon. But uh, if uh, if we um, if we want uh, to 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 send both epsilon to zero and d to infinity, then uh, we see that uh, already our uh, results are not sharp because we have logarithm here and uh, d square here, which is uh, quite a big gap. And before Buch uh, uh, Chow result, it was c to the d, I remind here, just uh, they put, I think they, they put paper in archive uh, in September. So before September of last year, it was c to the d, so it was huge gap. And uh, <clears throat> uh, here I will uh, start to give some results where I don't I will allow uh, to um, to have slightly worse dependence on epsilon, but much better dependence on d. Even uh, from uh, first uh, the paper in '89, uh, uh, one already can uh, could get uh, once again this this paper, of course, was uh, much more general, uh, and they proved uh, something about dispersion, and in particular for. Uh, for our uh, using VC dimension. And in particular for our problem from the paper, uh, uh, we could get uh, the following result. Uh, using VC dimension of axis parallel boxes, we can get a result uh, which is uh, essentially linear in D, but by the price of additional logarithm of one over epsilon. So if one over epsilon is not terribly large with respect to dimension, this result is clearly better than uh, than uh, upper bound, even with d square, but I remind that uh, till very recently it was c to the d. Moreover, uh, quite recently Rudolf uh, proved uh, that uh, the same result we can get without using VC dimension just by putting random points uniformly uh, in the cube, which is which is quite natural. I will say more because uh, 
I will be using the same method, of course, putting uh, random methods, uh, uh, random points uniformly distributed into Q. And uh, one can see that I said that uh, uh, that epsilon shouldn't be uh, terribly small, uh, so that uh, this result is better. So this result is better if you have such bound on epsilon. So to to use result from one has sense uh, uh, only if uh, epsilon is less than d to the minus d. So it's uh, really we sending epsilon to zero by fixing dimension. But if you want to, to think about this function as function of two variables, not one variable, uh, we need to understand uh, much more. <clears throat> so this is about uh, uh, results. And uh, if you combine all what I said, that it would be natural to conjecture that in D behaves like uh, D over epsilon, uh, which uh, actually was conjectured and uh, uh, <clears throat> Actually, a recent result of Buch Tao, uh, Buch Chao uh, supports this. This is very recent result, like I said last year, uh, that uh, if epsilon is very, very small, then uh, n epsilon d indeed larger than d over epsilon. But uh, this is not true uh, for all relations between uh, epsilon and d. So Snavets proved that it is. Uh, it can be bounded uh, logarithmically. Uh, so there exists some constant C depending on epsilon, of course, dependence is terrible. It's not one over epsilon, uh, such that n epsilon D is less than uh, logarithm uh, of D for epsilon less than quarter. And uh, <coughs> when, uh, so for epsilon uh, in zero quarter, uh, we, uh, we have uh, combining this result with lower bound uh, that I mentioned, we, we have such behavior that uh, n epsilon d is uh, c epsilon times uh, log d. So I like to present dependence between epsilon and d uh, on such uh, plane uh, with coordinates here, I will put d and here one over epsilon. So if I combine uh, what uh, what I already said, uh, it will be something like this. If I fix D, so I fix D and start to send epsilon to zero, then here I know behavior. See, it's something one over epsilon. If I fix uh, epsilon and start to send D to infinity, here I also know behavior. This is something like uh, logarithm D. But question, of course, if uh, if I start to send epsilon to zero and d to infinity uh, without relation, without fixing, uh, and without uh, without fixing one of them and without fixing relations between d and epsilon, then we have uh, a lot of room for uh, for bounds and for understanding and not too too much uh, known about this, uh, except some bounds that I mentioned and that I want to discuss and to improve. Uh, let me uh, let me say that I said uh, that of course dependence on epsilon is terrible and indeed uh, in Sosnovets paper if uh, we look carefully we will get such dependence which is of course uh, not acceptable uh, the bound is good only if epsilon really large but uh, using his method and uh, some additional ideas but essentially it was uh, his method with much more careful calculations, uh, Mario Ulrich and Jan Weberl, they improved uh, the dependence uh, on C epsilon essentially to one over epsilon square, which is already reasonable. And uh, because uh, of this bound uh, uh, that they proved and once again lower bound of uh, that I mentioned, they also conjecture that n epsilon d should uh, should behave like uh, log d over epsilon, which is not true as we know now because of this result. Uh, but uh, what I also want to say is that uh, this bound with such c epsilon, uh, well, this bound with such c epsilon is better when epsilon is large, but uh, still it's not constant. It can be of the order one over D. 
uh, it's already uh, good. So uh, if uh, epsilon of the order, say polynomially with power one over d to some power, which is uh, which is smaller than one, then uh, this bound with log d is better. And uh, and I would like to mention, if I will have time to discuss my proofs, uh, it will be important that uh, Sosnovets and Weberal uh, proof, uh, it is also based on random choice of points, but uh, they don't use uniform distribution. Uh, somehow it was surprising, and uh, I want to discuss it later, that surprisingly, uh, the, they, uh, they, they put, uh, they consider some lattice inside uh, the cube, uh, zero one cube. And uh, they took point randomly uh, running on this lattice uh, because uh, lattice is very large with very small grid. Uh, this point should behave like uniformly distributed, but it is not and it gives better result, which was, at least for me, it was very surprising. <laughs> and I will discuss it a bit more later. And uh, finally, before I start uh, new results and proofs, uh, I will uh, give a couple of remarks on really large epsilon. But before I say that epsilon is large, if it's larger than one over D, but here we will discuss really constant uh, epsilon. So first observation is that of course, if epsilon is larger than half, then I can put just one point. So I will put one point in the center of the cube. And then of course you cannot find uh, you cannot find uh, access parallel box larger than volume half, uh, which doesn't contain this point. So it's clear that n equals to one. Uh, Sosnovets also in the same paper, he proved uh, that uh, in fact, if epsilon larger than quarter, then behavior uh, is one over epsilon minus uh, quarter, which is surprising because you see that upper bound doesn't depend on d. So for large uh, epsilon, you can send d to infinity, but upper bound, if you separate yourself from quarter, will be still uh, constant, which is on one hand surprising, on another hand, it's not surprising. It should be like uh, this for some number because uh, for, for epsilon equals half, it is one. So uh, it doesn't grow. Uh, to d and I emphasize that uh, for epsilon less than quarter, we should have something like this. So a quarter essentially point of phase transition when uh, this function change behavior. Uh, very recently also last year, but uh, he didn't, well, he has preprint, but he didn't uh, publish it yet. Uh, my master student, Kurt McKay, he, he improved, uh, he improved uh, slightly dependence on epsilon instead of linear, it is one over square root. Also for epsilon is uh, equals to quarter. And uh, of course it is an interesting question to understand uh, what's going on at quarter or if you uh, close to quarter from any side, uh, either you are slightly larger than quarter or slightly smaller than quarter because uh, I remind that in this C epsilon, there is uh, one minus four epsilon. So if you start to be less than quarter, but very close to one, it also, uh, it also spoils uh, everything. So it's really interesting to understand behavior at quarter. Uh, sir, uh, yes. is there a relation of this quantity to all two discrepancy? Yes, but I'm not going to speak about this. Uh, I didn't say that, of course, so this, uh, this quantity is uh, motivation comes actually from many problems in discrete uh, geometry and from, uh, uh, from approximation. And one of these is exactly what you ask. Uh, it is uh, quite important for, uh, for discrepancy, but I'm not Because it's also, it's also lower bounded with uh, exactly the method that you said by Beck, I think. Yeah, when you take a lattice and you take uh, lower bounds, but discrepancy is a uh, more delicate problem, actually. <clears throat> Sasha, yes, one more question, if you don't mind. So, uh, when you give references, I also remember that there is a book uh, by Aldous on Poisson clumping heuristics, and he gives uh, many citations about people looking at the size of the largest square in the unit square with n uniform points. 
but somehow you don't mention these. Is it the same problem or? Uh, you mean for the mention two, you see? Well, in, in the image, huge it's fixed. What? I think it's fixed dimension, but. Mm -hmm. No, no, there are many, many uh, works when dimension is equal to two, actually. I don't mention because my point is to send D to infinity and epsilon to zero. Because you see, especially in view of this uh, Buch Chow result, which is, of course, very recent, uh, you have that uh, lower bound D over epsilon when epsilon goes to zero. Uh, well, there are many, many results, you are right. Uh, but I choose some related to to to, to my talk. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, I actually don't know. I don't know. I don't know too many results with d say larger than two. For, well, for I, two, I, yes, and for two, of course, whatever I say has uh, very little sense because I don't care about absolute constants, and uh -huh. if it's two. There are a huge amount of work working really on constants to get uh, to get constant to improve constant, and uh, with respect to what I'm speaking about, it well, all, all such results are much better because my constants I, I don't control them. I, I want to if I want I can control them. Uh, it's not a problem, but I will get something like one hundred is like one point one. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I see something in the chat. I, I'm going to speak if I will have time about Torus also. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so I, I want now to summarize what I said about upper bounds and once again, what I really interested in uh, is epsilon goes to zero and d goes to infinity at any speed and any relation between them. Uh, so uh, what what we have uh, till very recently uh, is uh, we can uh, split uh, into three cases. So uh, one case when epsilon essentially one over d or larger. Then uh, we will uh, have logarithmic in D, but epsilon square in the denominator. Uh, then if epsilon is small, but not too small, uh, uh, then uh, we have D over epsilon times ln one over epsilon. And if epsilon really goes to zero, we have one over epsilon, but uh, C to the D, it was uh, before uh, very recent preprint of Buch and Chao, and uh, they they essentially they preprint uh, the result uh, corrected last part. So instead of this, now we have uh, uh, much better bound. It's polynomial, not uh, power, and uh, so and splitting point now is uh, essentially d to the d, not uh, e to the c to the d. And uh, of course, it's very hard to read such formulas. So, uh, but uh, but uh, well, but it's uh, uh, what we have uh, right now. And uh, what is my improvement? My improvement is the following theorem uh, for small epsilon. Uh, we have uh, the following results. So, uh, if uh, epsilon is small. Then we can uh, substitute the power by logarithm by the price of uh, ln here. But uh, if epsilon is not too small, uh, then uh, we can substitute logarithm of one over epsilon by double logarithm. So uh, uh, to, to discuss sharpness, uh, we will get that for uh, epsilon, which is uh, very small, we now have uh, almost sharp estimate uh, like logarithm of d, but the price, of course, uh, logarithm here. And uh, if epsilon uh, if epsilon is not that small, uh, like I said, we can substitute logarithm by lan lan, which uh, in certain regimes, of course, uh, uh, is big improvement. So this is. Uh, this is uh, my result about, uh, well, uh, about almost all epsilon. I will speak slightly uh, 
about uh, large chips on, uh, later. Uh, and what is also important that uh, this we can get using random uniformly random choice of points, which are uniformly distributed uh, in the cube. And uh, very interestingly, uh, there is result uh, of uh, uh, Henry Crick, uh, Kunz, and Rudolf on the restriction of this method. If you choose points randomly, then with high probability, your lower bound will be uh, like this. So it's limitation of the method of randomness. So if you compare with uh, my result, which uh, which can be formulated uh, like I wrote here, uh, then um, uh, then uh, what we will see, we will see that uh, if I compare first bound here and first bound here, the difference only in logarithm d. If you compare second bound here with second bound here, then the difference only in lan lan. So at least for random choice of points, uh, we already have, um, we are very close to, to getting sharp estimates. Uh, but of course uh, the worst position or the best position of points, uh, well, it's probably random method cannot catch this. And uh, my second result that, uh, that I want to present now is uh, that uh, what's going on with large epsilon, it's slight improvement of uh, Sosnovets uh, Ulrich Weberal result that uh, we, can, uh, we can get such bound. Uh, and uh, improvement is very slight. Uh, in, in the result, uh, they have the same, but power of logarithm is squared. So I removed one square. And uh, what is interesting, uh, well, this bound is better once again, this epsilon is essentially one over D. But uh, what is interesting here is that uh, uh, it, it, I, I will use almost uh, ra ra uniform randomness. Uh, I don't need lattice points, but I need to adjust slightly uh, randomness, uh, which is given by, by uniform distribution. And uh, I will say how and why. So this about results. And now I want to, to discuss uh, proofs. Uh, well, probably I will say, well, I combine all results. So to look at formula is not probably very interesting, but uh, I prefer to look at uh, such a splitting of D epsilon plane. So if D is large, uh, but epsilon is not very large, we are here and we have such bound, then uh, if uh, that, which is one over epsilon between this and this, we have such bound and et cetera. So we essentially split uh, this plane in four parts and in each part we have uh, some bound. So uh, <clears throat> all bounds, they look like function of epsilon times function of D. Uh, to say the truth, I just think that this is function of two variables, which is not two variables, which is not uh, a product function. And uh, because all our methods that we use till now, they give some product of two functions, that's why probably we cannot catch uh, behavior because we deal with functions of two variables and we try to present it as a product of two functions. Well, for me, it's uh, very similar to Dvoretsky theorem, which we have a similar problem that we usually uh, try to find best function for dimension, but then we lose uh, dependence on epsilon and uh, vice versa. And uh, uh, sir, could you remind yes? the result of your student again for large epsilon? Uh, for large epsilon, it's uh, if epsilon it's interesting only if epsilon, I forget what, well, e epsilon is larger than quarter, then- So it's uh, interesting, it's smaller than one half, right? But smaller, yeah, for half you have one. One, so <laughs> Not interesting. So N is less than, uh, I forget, let me write like this, C over square root of epsilon minus one quarter. So it's, inter it's essentially constant unless epsilon too close to quarter. But if epsilon is too close to quarter, we don't know. Well, it depends how close. Uh -huh. If it's too close, but not, not very <laughs> too close, then, uh, then it's uh, such function. But of course, if I take epsilon like quarter plus one over D, then it's already not so good estimate. 
so it's also interesting if epsilon is very close to one half. If it's one half minus delta, can you have a function that tends to one? Uh, probably it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't think about this, but you are right. Probably it's interesting to look uh, how it behaves if epsilon goes to half. Uh, when we start to when we start to jump from one to two and for constant but large constant, but like I said, uh, such results in this result uh, you really need to catch uh, constants, and uh, in not in all what I'm saying I don't care really about constants. I mean absolute constants, which don't mm -hmm. depend on dimension or on any parameters that I'm discussing now. Sasha, uh, can yeah. you quickly explain on physical level why quota is so special? Uh, this I don't know actually. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I know I know that some some proofs go go via coordinate projection to two dimensional space, and uh, uh -huh, okay, this could be related to getting quarter because. Especially in lower bounds, say when we uh, we get this logarithm. But it's not just I, about the bounds. It's just a phase transition, as you said. It's not only yes, bounds. It's, yes, it's phase transition, and it's it's not clear. But it it could be related to the fact that at some moment in some proofs we pass to two dimensional space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and we return to previous question where the probably two dimensional cases were important. Mm -hmm. But so if you were to pass to three dimensional case, would you have some phase transition with one over eight also? Like it's is it really one quarter or not? No, it's really one quarter because for one over eight you get logarithm d, it's already proved. Uh, and uh, if you pass at least in proofs that I know, you don't gain if you pass to uh, to three dimensional case. There is no reason to pass to three dimensional case in 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 that proofs. But probably you can create some proof where it's really important. But but remember that about one over eight we get logarithm d. We don't have uh, constant dependent on c only. So, uh, so let me move unless you have more questions. Uh, so I will uh, now discuss uh, ideas of the proof. Uh, first idea is uh, just just standard. So uh, we will use standard uh, epsilon net techniques. Well, better to say delta net technique uh, with uh, union bounds. So. Uh, we will consider a set of uh, random points independently uniformly distributed in the cube. Uh, cube has volume one, so it's probability space. And to show uh, that with good probability, every box of volume epsilon contains at least one point, we need to construct something which would uh, play as uh, delta net. So some set of uh, test boxes, which I will call, of co call later uh, delta net. And it should satisfy the following. Each rectangle in this net contains a point from P uh, would imply that each rectangle uh, that uh, I am interested in uh, in RD axis parallel boxes of volume at least epsilon contains a point from P. But of course, uh, why I need this? Because uh, I want to control uh, uh, cardinality of net. So of course, my net will be finite. Uh, the simplest, uh, well, the simplest, well, we have zero one. We have some box of volume epsilon, say box B. I want uh, to find some box, uh, say B zero, uh, with the property that if point inside B zero, then point inside B. Of course, simplest, uh, simplest way to, to think uh, uh, is to say that for every B in RD, there exist B0 uh, in uh, my set uh, such that uh, B0 will be inside B. And this will be main idea for first theorem when epsilon is not large, it's exactly what I'm going to construct. If epsilon is large, 
then this uh, will not work. So I will remove this property. My B0 will not be inside B, but it will still have uh, such property. If point inside B0, then the point inside B. So on this picture, B0 could be like this, but point will be still here. So this is why I formulated in such strange way because uh, I, uh, I want to be able to work with boxes B0, which are not inside B. So uh, then uh, of course I will use uh, union bound. So I want uh, to estimate uh, probability of good event. So I will pass to probability of bad event. Uh, bad event is there exists a rectangle in N which contains no points from P. Then we take sum of probabilities. Uh, this is union bound uh, that given rectangle uh, in N not containing points from P. And uh, what is good in this problem, uh, what simplifies our life a lot, uh, that uh, individuals bounds are very simple. We have, we have access uh, rectangular boxes. So to compute probability is just to compute their volume. And this is uh, very simple. Uh, uh, what, uh, what we need, of course, we need that volume uh, is not too small to, to get uh, good probabilities. So in particular, this already gives uh, one, one restrictions on set N uh, that uh, boxes in N, we should control uh, volumes. Uh, they, sh they shouldn't be too small. And uh, the main difficulty here is uh, to, to have that this set is not, uh, doesn't have too large cardinality. Uh, this is main difficulty. Usually in such problems you have to balance uh, probability with cardinality. Uh, so usually we have two problems to estimate uh, individual probabilities to get very sharp bounds and to estimate cardinality. But here essentially uh, probability is given because uh, just volume of box. So here main difficulty is to construct a set of not so large cardinality. And what Rudolf used, Rudolf used in his proof a concept of Delta cover, which I'm not going to describe uh, to construct uh, such set. Uh, and uh, we will use slightly different uh, approach. We will use different construction because Delta cover, they were created for different problems. They work here, but give, uh, give uh, not so sharp result, not so good result. Well, <laughs> results are very similar because it's only logarithmical difference, but still uh, we will construct a set which, which, is, which just uh, fits this problem. Uh, it doesn't have additional properties and we gain a bit. Well, and let, uh, let me uh, discuss uh, construction. So uh, for first theorem, uh, I will use uh, construction that I just said that uh, my, uh, my net, which I will call delta net, uh, will uh, satisfy this. So for every box, uh, for every box uh, in, uh, in this set, we, follow the, uh, we will find box uh, in the net, which is inside. So property that it has points and B has points. Uh, immediate and we need to control volume. So I will call it delta net in a sense that uh, we lose in volume at most one minus delta. And uh, using, uh, using just direct calculations, very simple. It's essentially the same as uh, Rudolf uh, proof. He's, he formulated slightly differently, but it's exactly what he did. So uh, it's his lemma, but it's uh, very straightforward. Uh, so if we will be able to construct uh, such a delta net uh, and if we control cardinality, which is well at most free, but of course we are thinking about something e to the dimension, then with uh, very large probability, uh, we will have that uh, our, uh, our n can be estimated by this number. So as usual, logarithm of uh, cardinality divided essentially by epsilon. I will apply it with delta equals half or something like this or quarter. So essentially behavior is one over epsilon times logarithm of the cardinality. The proof, uh, I don't have too much time. 
uh, proof, like I said, uh, is direct. So le let me mention this, uh, but very briefly. So uh, we will consider n capital points uh, uniformly distributed in the cube. Uh, then uh, it is enough to show uh, what that uh, just definition that for every uh, no, I, I want to have that in every uh, in every box I have a point. So for every uh, box and then with uh, such volume, uh, we have a point inside. So uh, and we use independence and as I said, we estimate probability of bet even. So uh, probability that uh, in given box there is no points because they are uh, independent is one minus volume to the end. Then, uh, so probability that there exists such box is just a uh, sum of probabilities. So it's cardinality of n times what I get for individual. And then uh, what we need to get, we need to get uh, such equation. So whenever uh, this is true, we have our lemma. Uh, we, we have realization of random points and actually with uh, large probability. And uh, if it, I take logarithm, I, I will get uh, what I claim. So I hope it's clear if you just try to prove some lemma like this, you will come immediately with such proof. It's, uh, it's standard and uh, direct. Uh, so I want uh, to pass to construction of, uh, of, uh, of nets which is also uh, relatively simple. If you try to do, you probably would do the same. Uh, so uh, construction uh, of the nets, uh, what we want? Uh, we want to, uh, to, to construct uh, some net of good cardinality for boxes uh, which satisfy the following properties. So they are axis parallel, so it's product of segments. Uh, I can write something like this. And uh, it will be important to control uh, length of each, uh, uh, each interval. And what we know about length, we know that the uh, product is larger than epsilon. So how to do it? Uh, first, of course, uh, I would try naive approach. It's actually what I tried uh, at the beginning uh, to see that it doesn't work. Uh, that uh, we have uh, volume is larger than epsilon. So all of them larger than epsilon. So in each dimension, in each segment, I have product space. So in each segment, I can, I have interval, say AI, BI. This is my interval II. And I will take some delta net. And then I approximate endpoints. So I will take point here, point here, this will be my approximation of II. So uh, this, uh, this is very natural approach. Uh, what delta to take, it should be comparable with the length. It should be uh, slightly less. So delta, which would work here is uh, one over four epsilon. And uh, then of course I will take product of uh, such, uh, uh, such approximations, my box B0, will be product of I, I prime. So, uh, so this is natural idea, uh, I write it here. So for each I, we will approximate endpoints. Uh, we will get reasonably good approximation uh, I, I prime of I, I. Uh, we will control uh, lengths. So uh, because it's delta approximation, we will lose at least two delta from each side. And uh, our set will be set of such B zeros. What is problem here? Problem you see immediately, size of this net will be of order one over epsilon to 2D, which spoils uh, everything. You will not get a uh, good bounds uh, uh, with such uh, cardinality of net. So I want still, I want to use this approach, but uh, I need to adjust it to, to get something better. So uh, what is my idea? My idea is that if I look here, I cannot have all lengths are too small. So if one is small, then the second one from the, well, second smallest one cannot be too small. If one is 
say already epsilon, then all others should be one. If one is epsilon over two, then all others should be very close to one. So I'm going to use this idea. So in, in this idea, I will do the same. I will uh, approximate, uh, I will take delta net in each uh, zero one, I have product space, but my delta will depend on I. So my delta will depend on length Li. So how, uh, how to do this? Uh, uh, first, we rearrange uh, lengths uh, in increasing order. So, uh, of course, later I should uh, take union over all rearrangements. So, uh, and I will use that product of Li is larger than epsilon. Then say L2 is already, I, I should have L2 times L1 larger than epsilon. So L2 is already larger than square root of epsilon. So if I use this idea, I will get that Lj should be larger than epsilon to the one over j, which is here. So uh, the larger Lj, the larger corresponding delta j we can take. And uh, ideally, of course, I would like to take uh, delta j of the same order. I'm not going to give precise calculations. I just give given idea. And to construct net as above. So what I gain, I gain, I, I gain a lot in cardinality of the net and for not so small epsilon, it already would work. But for small epsilon, there will be some problem because I said that uh, uh, I assumed something, but uh, I assume that uh, I work just with uh, increasing rearrangement, but then I should get and repeat this procedure for any rearrangement. So at the end, I will need to multiply uh, cardinality of net uh, by de factorial number of uh, rearrangements. And uh, this will be unacceptable for, uh, for, 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 for D, which is large with respect to epsilon. Um, so what I will do, I probably don't have too much time, but I will try to explain. Uh, I, will, uh, I will partition uh, this uh, else in some sets and uh, in, in, in this group, I will take the same uh, delta. So, uh, well, I, I will give just very briefly idea. So I will uh, split coordinates like this. First, I will use essentially the uh, splitting for coordinates. First two will be my set A1. And second, uh, I will have A2. And then I will take uh, five to the two to the three. This will be my A3. And I continue in this way. So I will get two to the J minus one plus one to the two to the J. It's my coordinates here. I will have a J and so on. I will have at the end, I will have two to the K. Let us say that D equals uh, two to the K. This will be my last set. And inside the set, I will use the same deltas. Delta one for this set, delta two for this set, delta three for this set, delta j. I will write what it is, but it's uh, it's hard to catch why it is so uh, without calculation, but just to give you idea. It's uh, order of delta. Then cardinality of net, of net uh, will be a product over j in each set and uh, product of deltas uh, when i is an i i uh, delta say i have two over delta i squared because i need to approximate two endpoints and uh, well i probably will not provide calculations but uh, you can estimate this nicely and also number of permutations is less number of permutations uh, will be uh, uh, how many choices you have to choose first set, say here. It's uh, 2K choose 2K uh, minus one. And then you continue in this way. So you have something like this, which, uh, which you also can bound. It will be two to the two D. Uh, so uh, my, in, in this way, I, I don't want to provide estimates, but in this way, I, uh, I gain uh, in size of the, uh, of the net. And also uh, what I need uh, in this scheme to, to, to prove, 
I need to prove that I don't lose too much in volume. So uh, loss in volume uh, after we do this procedure uh, can be estimated also its product over J less than K product of uh, I in IJ and uh, Li minus uh, two delta I. And what we can show, we can show that we lose at most half of the volume, which is acceptable for us. So delta is half. And this will give me good bound, good bound for, uh, for D less than logarithm one over epsilon, when epsilon goes to say to zero. Uh, and like I said before, for this, uh, I don't care actually about uh, combining uh, uh, coordinates because if I don't combine, I will get the same result. This combining of coordinates will be important when D is larger than one over epsilon. And uh, I think I wrote something. Yes, uh, for such regime, uh, I will do the same procedure, but I will stop at some moment. Uh, and moment will be, well, let me write to M minus one plus one and so on to M uh, uh, is uh, lan one over epsilon. If D is larger at this moment, I essentially stop. I will do the same procedure later, but I stop changing delta. So here, uh, here I will proceed as before. So main ingredient for such D that here I will have delta, uh, what is M plus J will be the same. The main idea is that I don't need to increase delta after it's already starts uh, to be equal to one over eight D. And uh, what is my gain here? Uh, what the main reason for the gain is L M plus J is larger than uh, what I said before. It's one, one over epsilon over two m plus j is larger than one minus one over two to the j. So why why I'm gaining and what is the difference uh, with uh, periodic setting, which I didn't describe yet, that if my length is here, then it means my endpoints are very close to endpoints zero and one. So in fact, I don't need to approximate here. I need, uh, because I know that my endpoint should be close to one and close to zero. So I need approximation only here. And, and uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, uh, this gives a huge gain in uh, cardinality of net that I don't approximate uh, uh, essentially middle of the second, but this middle is, uh, is very large. So in this I gain uh, for such D and this is reason that uh, I'm getting uh, log log instead of log. So, should, uh... so this is just main idea of the proofs. And uh, very briefly, uh, when epsilon is large, why lattice distribution work better than uniform one? And answer, one of answers, but I think it's very important that uh, if you want to, if our box is of volume epsilon, say the, the shortest length should be epsilon. So in fact, I know that uh, in fact, uh, well, it's not very rigorous, but intuitively I don't need to have points here. I just need to, to separate myself from the, uh, from the boundary. So essentially I need to look only here. And uh, this, uh, and uh, if I have lattice point, uh, what Susnavets used, uh, then of course they have uh, lattice with probably very uh, tiny step, but still uh, they, they separated from, uh, from the boundary. So uh, this is a reason that they, in my opinion, this is the main reason that they got uh, improvement. And uh, my idea was just to adjust, uh, to adjust distribution. 
I still have uh, uniform randomness. And if my point uh, falls here, it's okay. But if my point falls here, I just move it here. So it's slight adjustment of uh, distribution. If my point falls here, I substitute it for with this point. And surprisingly, just uh, this adjustment already uh, works uh, perfectly. So I wrote here formally uh, what I'm doing, but this is really for each coordinate. I take my segment zero one and I look at epsilon here and one minus epsilon here. And then, uh, and then if my point is here, I don't change. I mean, coordinate of random point. But if my point here, I moved it here. If my point here, I move it here. Then I essentially <coughs> repeat uh, what I did before and uh, we will get result. So uh, I have probably four minutes. So I will discuss very briefly periodic setting because uh, it's what people do and it's what is also interesting. Uh, so periodic setting means that uh, intervals when we consider uh, zero one, we, uh, we consider intervals of standard style when a, a less than b, b, a less than b, but we also can consider case when b is larger than a. In this case, I start with a, I take all these points and all these points. So it's union of two intervals. Or if I glue one and zero, it's a, a periodic interval. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, this problem is almost the same as before. But uh, uh, it gives, uh, well, we have, it gives different answers. Uh, so if we combine uh, two results uh, uh, for upper estimate of Rudolf and uh, lower estimate of Mario Ulrich, then we will have behavior, we will not have logarithm anymore. We always have D over epsilon as a lower bound. And upper bound is uh, here, uh, which is, uh, so which is logarithmically sharp. And uh, very interesting that Rudolf result provides probably simpler proof uh, for uh, standard setting, but it doesn't provide better result for standard setting uniform uh, using uh, random points. But uh, we see dimension of uh, periodic axis parallel boxes is larger. So we cannot use VC dimension unless we want to, to lose uh, logarithm it would give additional logarithm of D. So Rudolf result is better uh, for periodic setting because uh, we see dimension and periodic setting is larger. We cannot use uh, old result of four authors here. And uh, if I, so here what was known before, and if I just apply whatever we discuss in periodic setting, uh, we will, uh, I, I will get uh, such uh, bounds which are slightly better. Uh, and, uh, and it also works for random points. So, well, actually only one first bound is, uh, is better because, uh, uh, because we have uh, logarithmic for, uh, for epsilon less than D. Uh, in this regime, this bound is the same as Rudolf's bound. So I, I will stop here. Sorry, I was Russian at the end. <laughs> I did. Thank you, Sasha. Um, 